Thus Spoke Zarathustra by Frederick Nietzsche Part 3 The Three Metamorphoses Three metamorphoses of the spirit do I designate to you, how the spirit becometh a camel, the camel a lion, and the lion at last a child. Many heavy things are there for the spirit, the strong load-bearing spirit in which reverence dwelleth. For the heavy and the heaviest longeth its strength. What is heavy? So asketh the load-bearing spirit, then kneeleth it down like the camel, and wanteth to be well laden. What is the heaviest thing, ye heroes? Asketh the load-bearing spirit. That I may take it upon me, and rejoice in my strength. Is it not this? to humiliate oneself in order to mortify one's pride, to exhibit one's folly in order to mock at one's wisdom? Or is it this, to desert our cause when it celebrateth its triumph, to ascend high mountains to tempt the tempter? Or is it this, to feed on the acorns and grass of knowledge, and for the sake of truth to suffer hunger of soul? Or is it this, to be sick and dismiss comforters, and make friends of the deaf who never hear thy requests? Or is it this, to go into foul water when it is the water of truth, and not disclaim cold frogs and hot toads? Or is it this, to love those who despise us, and give one's hand to the phantom when it is going to frighten us? All these heaviest things the load-bearing spirit taketh upon itself, and like the camel which, when laden, hasteneth into the wilderness, so hasteneth the spirit into its wilderness. Its last lord it here seeketh, Hostile will it be to him and to its last god, for victory will it struggle with the great dragon. What is the great dragon which the spirit is no longer inclined to call lord and god? Thou shalt, is the great dragon called. But the spirit of the lion saith, I will. Thou shalt, lieth in its path, sparkling with gold, a scale-covered beast, and on every scale glittereth golden, thou shalt. The values of a thousand years glitter on those scales, and thus speaketh the mightiest of all dragons, all the values of things glitter on me. All values have already been created, and all created values do I represent. Verily there shall be no I will any more. Thus speaketh the dragon. My brethren, wherefore is there need of the lion in the spirit? Why sufficeth not the beast of burden, which renounceth and is reverent? To create new values, that even the lion cannot yet accomplish, but to create itself freedom for new creating, that can the might of the lion do. To create itself freedom, and give a holy nay even unto duty. For that, my brethren, there is need of the lion. To assume the right to new values, that is the most formidable assumption for a load-bearing and reverent spirit. Verily, unto such a spirit it is praying, and the work of a beast of prey. As its holiest, it once loved thou shalt. Now is it forced to find illusion and arbitrariness even in the holiest things, that it may capture freedom from its love. The lion is needed for this capture. But tell me, my brethren, what the child can do, which even the lion could not do. Why hath the praying lion still to become a child? Innocence is the child, 
and forgetfulness. A new beginning, a game, a self-rolling wheel, a first movement, a holy yay. I, for the game of creating, my brethren, there is needed a holy yea unto life, its own will. Willeth now the spirit, his own world winneth the world's outcast. Three metamorphoses of the spirit have I designated to you. How the spirit became a camel, the camel a lion, and the lion at last a child. Thus spake Zarathustra, and at that time he abode in the town which is called the Pied Cow. The Academic Chairs of Virtue People commended unto Zarathustra a wise man, as one could discourse well about sleep and virtue. Greatly was he honoured and rewarded for it, and all the youths sat before his chair. To him went Zarathustra, and sat among the youths before his chair, and thus spake the wise man, Respect and modesty in presence of sleep, that is the first thing and to go out of the way of all who sleep badly and keep awake at night. Modest is even the thief in presence of sleep. He always stealeth softly through the night. Immodest, however, is the night watchman. Immodestly he carrieth his horn. No small art is it to sleep. It is necessary for that purpose to keep awake all day. Ten times a day must thou overcome thyself, that causeth wholesome weariness and is poppy to the soul. Ten times must thou reconcile again with thyself, for overcoming it bitterness and badly sleep the unreconciled. Ten truths must thou find during the day, otherwise wilt thou seek truth during the night, and thy soul will have been hungry. Ten times must thou laugh during the day, and be cheerful, otherwise thy stomach, the father of affliction, will disturb thee in the night. Few people know it, but one must have all the virtues in order to sleep well. Shall I bear false witness? Shall I commit adultery? Shall I covet my neighbor's maidservant? All that would ill accord with good sleep. And even if one have all the virtues, there is still one thing needful, to send the virtues themselves to sleep at the right time. That they may not quarrel with one another, the good females, and about thee, thou unhappy one. Peace with God and thy neighbor, so desireth good sleep and peace also with thy neighbor's devil, otherwise it will haunt thee in the night. Honor to the government and obedience, and also to the crooked government, so desireth good sleep. How can I help it, if power like to walk on crooked legs? He who leadeth his sheep to the greenest pasture shall always be for me the best shepherd so doth it accord with good sleep. Many honours I want not, nor great treasures, they excite the spleen, but it is bad sleeping without a good name and a little treasure. A small company is more welcome to me than a bad one, but they must come and go at the right time, so doth it accord with good sleep. Well, also, do the poor in spirit please me, they promote sleep. Blessed are they, especially if one always give in to them. Thus passeth the day unto the virtuous. When night cometh, then take I good care not to summon sleep. It disliketh to be summoned. Sleep, the lord of the virtues. But I think of what I have done and thought during the day. Thus ruminating, patient as a cow, I ask myself, what were thy ten overcomings, and what were the ten reconciliations, and the ten truths, and the ten laughters, with which my heart enjoyed itself? 
thus pondering and cradled by forty thoughts it overtaketh me all at once sleep the unsummoned the lord of the virtues sleep tappeth on mine eye and it turneth heavy sleep toucheth my mouth and it remaineth open verily on soft souls doth it come to me the dearest of thieves and stealeth from me my thoughts stupid do i then stand like this academic chair but not much longer do i then stand i already lie when zarathustra heard the wise man thus speak he laughed in his heart for thereby had a light dawned upon him and thus spake he to his heart a fool seemeth this wise man with his forty thoughts but i believe he knoweth well how to sleep happy even is he who liveth near this wise man such sleep is contagious even through a thick wall it is contagious a magic resideth even in his academic chair and not in vain did the youth sit before the preacher of virtue his wisdom is to keep awake in order to sleep well and verily if life had no sense and had i to choose nonsense this would be the desirablest nonsense for me also now know i well what people sought formerly above all else when they sought teachers of virtue good sleep they sought for themselves and poppy had virtues to promote it to all those belauded sages of the academic chairs wisdom was sleep without dreams they knew no higher significance of life even at present to be sure there are some like this preacher of virtue and not always so honourable but their time is past and not much longer do they stand there they already lie blessed are those drowsy ones for they shall soon nod to sleep thus spake zarathustra backworld's men once on a time zarathustra also cast his fancy beyond man like all backworld's men the work of a suffering and tortured god did the world then seem to me the dream and diction of a god did the world then seem to me colored vapors before the eyes of a divinely dissatisfied one good and evil and joy and woe and i and thou colored vapors did they seem to me before creative eyes the creator wished to look away from himself thereupon he created the world intoxicating joy is it for the sufferer to look away from his suffering and forget himself intoxicating joy and self-forgetting did the world once seem to me this world the eternally imperfect an eternal contradiction's image and imperfect image an intoxicating joy to its imperfect creator thus did the world once seem to me thus once on a time did i also cast my fancy beyond man like all backworld's men beyond man forsooth ah ye brethren that god whom i created was human work and human madness like all the gods a man was he and only a poor fragment of a man and ego out of mine own ashes and glow it came unto me that phantom and verily it came not unto me from the beyond what happened my brethren i surpassed myself the suffering one i carried mine own ashes to the mountain a brighter flame i contrived for myself and lo thereupon the phantom withdrew from me to me the convalescent would it now be suffering and torment to believe in such phantoms suffering would it now be to me and humiliation thus speak i to backworld's men suffering was it and impotence that created all backworlds and the short madness of happiness which only the greatest sufferer experienceth weariness which seeketh to get to the ultimate with one leap 
with a death leap, a poor ignorant weariness, unwilling even to will any longer, that createth all gods and back worlds. Believe me, my brethren, it was the body which despaired of the body. It groped with the fingers of the infatuated spirit at the ultimate walls. Believe me, my brethren, it was the body which despaired of the earth. It heard the bowels of existence speaking unto it. And then it sought to get through the ultimate walls with its head, and not with its head only, into the other world. But that other world is well concealed from man, that dehumanized, inhuman world, which is a celestial knot, and the bowels of existence do not speak unto man except as man. Verily, it is difficult to prove all being and hard to make it speak. Tell me, ye brethren, is not the strangest of all things best proved? Yea, this ego, with its contradiction and perplexity, speaketh most uprightly of its being, this creating, willing, evaluing ego, which is the measure and value of things. And this most upright existence, the ego, it speaketh of the body, and still implieth the body, even when it museth and raveth and fluttereth with broken wings. Always more uprightly learneth it to speak, the ego, and the more it learneth, the more doth it find titles and honors for the body and the earth. A new pride taught me mine ego, and that teach I unto men, no longer to thrust one's head into the sand of celestial things, but to carry it freely, a terrestrial head, which giveth meaning to the earth. A new will teach I unto men, to choose that path which man hath followed blindly, and to approve of it, and no longer to slink aside from it, like the sick and perishing, the sick and perishing, it was they who despised the body and the earth, and invented the heavenly world and the redeeming blood drops, but even those sweet and sad poisons they borrowed from the body and the earth, from their misery they sought escape, and the stars were too remote for them. Then they sighed, Oh, that there were heavenly paths by which to steal into another existence and into happiness. Then they contrived for themselves their bypaths and bloody droughts. Beyond the sphere of their body and this earth, they now fancied themselves transported, these ungrateful ones. But to what did they owe the convulsion and rapture of their transport to their body and this earth? Gentle is Zarathustra to the sickly. Verily, he is not indignant at their modes of consolation and ingratitude. May they become convalescents and overcomers, and create higher bodies for themselves. Neither is Zarathustra indignant at a convalescent who looketh tenderly on his delusions, and at midnight stealeth round the grave of his god. But sickness and a sick frame remain even in his tears. Many sickly ones have there always been among those who muse and languish for God. Violently they hate the discerning ones and the latest of virtues, which is uprightness. Backward they always gaze toward dark ages. Then, indeed, were delusion and faith something different. Raving of the reason was likeness to God, and doubt was sin. Too well do I know those godlike ones. They insist on being believed in, and that doubt is sin. Too well, also, do I know what they themselves most believe in. Verily, not in back worlds and redeeming blood drops. But in the body do they also believe most and their own body is for them the thing in itself. But it is a sickly thing to them, and gladly would they get out of their skin. 
Therefore hearken they to the preachers of death, and themselves preach back worlds. Hearken, rather, my brethren, to the voice of the healthy body. It is a more upright and pure voice. More uprightly and purely speaketh the healthy body, perfect and square built, and it speaketh of the meaning of the earth. Thus spake Zarathustra. The Despisers of the Body To the despisers of the body will I speak my word. I wish them neither to learn afresh nor teach anew, but only to bid farewell to their own bodies, and thus be dumb. Body am I, and soul, so saith the child, and why should one not speak like children? But the awakened one, the knowing one, saith, Body am I entirely, and nothing more, and soul is only the name of something in the body. The body is a big sagacity, a plurality with one sense, a war and a peace, a flock and a shepherd. An instrument of thy body is also thy little sagacity, my brother, which thou callest spirit. A little instrument and plaything of thy big sagacity, ego, sayest thou, and art proud of that word, but the greater thing, in which thou art unwilling to believe, is thy body with its big sagacity. It saith not ego, but doeth it. What the sense feeleth, what the spirit discerneth, hath never its end in itself. But sense and spirit would fain persuade thee that they are the end of all things. So vain are they. Instruments and playthings are sense and spirit. Behind them there is still the self. The self seeketh with its eyes of the senses. It hearkeneth also with the ears of the spirit. Ever hearkeneth the self, and seeketh, it compareth, mastereth, conquereth, and destroyeth. It ruleth, and is also the ego's ruler. Behind thy thoughts and feelings, my brother, there is a mighty lord, an unknown sage. It is called self. It dwelleth in thy body. It is thy body. There is more sagacity in thy body than in thy best wisdom. And who then knoweth why thy body requireth just thy best wisdom? Thyself laugheth at thine ego and its proud prancings. What are these prancings and flights of thought unto me, it saith to itself? A byway to my purpose. I am the leading string of the ego, and the prompter of its notions. The self saith unto the ego, Feel pain, and thereupon it suffereth, and thinketh how it may put an end thereto. And for that very purpose it is meant to think. The self saith unto the ego, Feel pleasure, thereupon it rejoiceth and thinketh how it may oft times rejoice, and for that very purpose it is meant to think. To the despisers of the body will I speak a word, that they despise is caused by their esteem. What is it that created esteeming and despising and worth and will? The creating self created for itself esteeming and despising. It created for itself joy and woe the creating body created for itself spirit, as a hand to its will. Even in your folly and despising, ye each serve yourself, ye despisers of the body. I tell you, your very self wanteth to die and turneth away from life. No longer can yourself do that which it desireth most. Create beyond itself. That is what it desireth most. That is all its fervor. But it is now too late to do so, so yourself wisheth to succumb, ye despisers of the body. To succumb, so wisheth yourself, and therefore have ye become despisers of the body, for ye can no longer create beyond yourselves. 
And therefore are ye now angry with life and with the earth, and unconscious envy is in the sidelong look of your contempt. I go not your way, ye despisers of the body, ye are no bridges for me to the superman. Thus spake Zarathustra. Joys and Passions My brother, when thou hast a virtue, and it is thine own virtue, thou hast it in common with no one. To be sure, thou wouldst call it by name and caress it. Thou wouldst pull its ears and amuse thyself with it. And lo, then hast thou its name in common with the people, and hast become one of the people, and the herd with thy virtue. Better for thee to say, Ineffable is it, and nameless, that which is pain and sweetness to my soul, and also the hunger of my bowels. Let thy virtue be too high for the familiarity of names, and if thou must speak of it, be not ashamed to stammer about it. Thus speak and stammer, that is my good that do I love, thus doth it please me entirely, thus only do I desire the good. Not as the law of a god do I desire it, not as a human law or a human need do I desire it. It is not to be a guide post for me to super-earths and paradises. An earthly virtue is it which I love, little prudence is therein, and the least everyday wisdom. But that bird built its nest beside me, therefore I love and cherish it. Now sitteth it beside me on its golden eggs. Thus shouldst thou stammer and praise thy virtue. Once hadst thou passions, and calledst them evil, but now hast thou only thy virtues, they grew out of thy passions. Thou implantedst thy highest aim into the heart of those passions, then became they thy virtues and joys. And though thou wert of the race of the hot-tempered, or of the voluptuous, or of the fanatical, or the vindictive, all thy passions in the end became virtues, and all thy devils angels. Once hadst thou wild dogs in thy cellar, but they changed at last into birds and charming songstresses. Out of thy poisons brewedst thou balsam for thyself, Thy cow, affliction, milkest thou, now drinketh thou the sweet milk of her udder. And nothing evil groweth in thee any longer, unless it be the evil that groweth out of the conflict of thy virtues. My brother, if thou be fortunate, then wilt thou have one virtue and no more. Thus goest thou easier over the bridge." Illustrious is it to have many virtues, but a hard lot, and many a one hath gone into the wilderness and killed himself, because he was weary of being the battle and battlefield of virtues. My brother, are war and battle evil? Necessary, however, is the evil. Necessary are the envy and the distrust and the backbiting among the virtues. Lo! how each of thy virtues is covetous of the highest place. It wanteth thy whole spirit to be its herald. It wanteth thy whole power, in wrath, hatred, and love. Jealous is every virtue of the others, and a dreadful thing is jealousy. Even virtues may succumb by jealousy. He whom the flame of jealousy encompasseth, turneth at last, like the scorpion, the poison sting against himself. Ah, my brother, hast thou ever seen a virtue backbite and stab itself? Man is something that hath to be surpassed, and therefore shalt thou love thy virtues, for thou wilt succumb by them. Thus spake Zarathustra.